Rick Hale, Rick Hale. It is Mojo, Mojo Monday. I'm excited. How are you? I'm incredibly awesome. <laughs> I'm incredibly trying to mix it up awesome. This week. I'm incredibly awesome. I'm I'm wearing pink according to your color wheel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe we'll pull that pink shirt into our conversation, but right? I realize it's red, but it might look pink on the screen. We'll That's see. That's what you tell me. I look down at it's it's got some elements of pink. I'm not going to argue your color blindness, but all not right, in not in public. When you bought the shirt, the question is, did you buy it logically or emotionally? Because today we are in our uh, series around negotiation. And the comp topic of conversation is there's this concept of logic versus emotion. And honestly, it, it's two different topics, but they're very much tied together in terms of how we approach, how a consumer receives, how a consumer engages negotiation. Why don't you set this conversation up for us, Rick? So logic and emotion live inside of your heart and mind. And the question is, which it's almost like they arm wrestle for decision making as part of the decision making chain. And it it's rare that you would make a decision without some emotional energy. The word motion is buried in the word emotion. And if it's not justified or validated through a logic place, a logical place or the brain that processes analytically, it often gets shot down if you pull yourself out of that emotional state long enough to analyze it logically. And so back to the shirt, you asked a fun question and this yeah. is unscripted people. Um, I'm in the Tommy Bahama store and there ain't nothing cheap in Tommy Bahama. I mean, this no. I'm not gonna tell you what the shirt costs, but it's triple digit and then some. And so emotionally I was drawn to it because I thought, man, that's a cool flash shirt. It's got good energy. It's, I like the material. And then I had to logically justify the price by it fits me well, it looks good. It's, you know, it's going to last because it's well-made. But if I hadn't checked those three boxes, I probably would have talked myself out of the emotional draw or the feeling or the attraction. Oh, so absolutely. yeah, they have to, they interact. The, the thing is they interact and they're interrelated and they, and it's not a constant, it's not a 50, 50 battle in one moment, one may be superior to the other. And then, you know, later today, buyer's remorse, we'll talk a little bit about that sneaks in because logic caught up with the emotional decision-making that you did earlier in the day. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, you probably heard the statement before that logic makes people think and emotion makes people act yet. They're both part of the decision-making process in, in terms of a negotiation, right? Like you can't a hundred percent separate one or the other. And if you did, it's, it's a recipe for disaster yet thinking is rational and emotion or feelings sometimes lead to the irrational, yet that's part of our life. We, we've got our conscious brain and our subconscious brain, and, and we live in a world that is probably uh, more and more centered into emotion in the sense of we care about what other people think, and that is, is a direct that line to our emotional state and everybody says they don't but yet social media would tell us otherwise right <laughs> well it would and and so this well that ties back to ego and yeah. what makes you feel whole what makes and so reflective of our conversation and negotiating with people how do you help someone feel better about themselves and better about their future by making positive decisions that create a win-win and so I looked up the definition of emotion, Brett, and I thought it was interesting because it's not exactly what I thought. And maybe this is just one definition and maybe you find a different one, but it's the natural, instinctive or intuitive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood or relationship with others. So that kind of implies it's not a controllable energy force in that it's natural, it's instinctive and it's intuitive. And yeah. So that's the interesting part. It's like, you know, an internal ping pong game or a counterbalancing game between that and then logic, which is all logic is, is a series of intellectual experiences. And, you know, you've intellectually developed a sense for good, bad or indifferent. And it's just it's it's like going back to the prior scoreboards in life that, hey, that was a winning decision. And that added up and that, you know, it's X's and O's. Yeah. And I do think some negotiations and some decisions 
lend themselves more to a logical perspective. Like if I was looking at an investment property, I'm probably going to heavily look at the numbers and the return on investment. A commercial deal has a cap rate, an ROI. You know, you're probably lending more to that logical side of the negotiation. It doesn't mean there's no emotion. It's just probably more heavily weighted in logic. Yet, I think most decisions, most negotiations in life that you would experience uh, are probably made from a place of emotion. They are. And you, I think there's two facets to what you're you're describing. One is the person in yep. their natural state or the way they see the world. We all have a different worldview. And in, in prior mojos, we talked about the disc and how, you know, SCs think differently than a DI or a driven and interpersonal. And the other thing is the environment and uh, the environment for that particular negotiation, to your point, commercial real estate, rarely would that be an emotional conversation. Commercial brokers don't lit, don't spend as much time, you know, poking emotional energy because most decisions are made intellectually and based on spreadsheets, past experience and training. You know, you've got this in a natural algorithm or a, role, a model that you're trying to plug it into for the economics to make sense. Yeah. And be be aware, we, we were touching on it a minute ago, ego still matters, whether you're emotionally driven, logic driven, or a blend of the two, which is very common, ego still matters. How do 100%. I win? When you're negotiating and helping someone win in negotiations, you better find out what makes them feel like a winner. What What's the checkbox? Yep. So let's put some framework to this conversation around negotiation. So uh, I would say there's three stages, right? You So you've got your consultation stage, which is your interaction with uh, the thought of the transaction ahead of time. Then you've got the uh, actual signing of the transaction, the closing of the transaction or the whether you're signing the contract or buying the shirt, um, th there's that moment in time where there's a commitment. But then there's this fun little thing afterwards, which we'll, we, uh, you could call it buyer's remorse. So let's let's start with consultation and work our way through these three stages. So in consultation, um, there's actually two things you need to be aware of is what you're saying and what you're hearing. Because sometimes you need to speak in logic and sometimes you need to speak in emotion, but you also need to be listening to where, what energy or what words are coming back from right. your client, right? Speak to that, Rick. Well, one aspect to your point is that recall. Like, so in any consultation, one is whoever has the better questions typically wins. So right out of the box, you better have yeah. premeditated questions because a question unasked is a question unanswered and you may miss a key element to their decision-making chain that discredits the entire transaction later. In other words, they wake up realizing they really didn't know what they knew on the front end and their change of heart strictly because they hadn't analyzed one component that wasn't discussed or discovered. So better questions matter. The other is permission to write and take notes. I think it's vital because you know the pen is mightier than the mind. And at some point, you may not, if it takes two or three months to get to the finish line and then there's an emotional disruptor and the, everything gets sideways back to the buyer's remorse and a change of, when, the clearer you are at the consultation, the easier it is to help them go back to what was prescribed as a win. And so it's all about the conversation. It's all about taking great notes and making sure that they know you're hearing them, which is what you're alluding to. And yeah. that's like that recall. Hey, what I heard you say was, if you had these four things, this transaction and this, you know, we find this product or property, it's a home run for you and your family and make it really clear, circle, highlight it, feed it back and just get confirmation, you know, cause you'll need that later at some point you will. Yeah. I think uh, it, it's the difference between you being an amateur or you being a professional. I think the amateur gets excited of a potential transaction and just runs head, head first into it and doesn't use that moment to create a consultation where the professional spends the time on the front end to save them pain on the back end. And, and that's really a, a professional consultation approach, right? And then we're gonna go through 
this transaction. And at some point in time, you're asking somebody to make a decision. H how does uh, logic make its way into that decision, whether it's something you're saying or what you're hearing, or how does emotion make it into the decision, whether it's what you're saying or what you're hearing? Well, you need both. And, and so back to the idea of it depends if there's two people in the decision-making chain, it's not uncommon that one operates more logically and one person in that relationship is the emotional driver. And so you have to feed them the food that fuels and inspires them the most. So make sure that the conversation is tailored to the things that in, it motivate them. And then it, at some point, again, in the process, it- But it hang on, I wanna, make a, I wanna make a point. That's it. why you do the consultation, right? Yeah. Well, if you, you don't know. discover that, you're you're going to speak incorrectly. Yeah, if you you hit someone who's logic based with a lot of emotion and you're emotional, they're going to either not hear you or you're going to discredit yourself in the process. So one of the important aspects to this whole the, the, we didn't go here, but you better be credible. Yeah. And as a newer practitioner, if you're new in the business, it's hard to be credible in all circumstances. But the most important thing to do is be interested more than interesting and speak less, ask questions more often, and you'll likely not discredit yourself. So one way not to fall into the trap of not knowing certain things is don't profess that you know things. Like ask great questions, premeditate your consultation. And then if you don't know, don't, you know, don't make up a story. Go, you know what, that's an incredibly profound question. I'm grateful you asked. In fact, I think it's important enough that I go seek out an expert and confirm the answer, even though in my heart, I'm clear on it. I think you deserve a second level of feedback and an expert in that exact arena or area, whether it's surveys, soils, structural engineering. I mean, there's lots of aspects to helping someone. Pink shirts. Over. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. A, funny that you say that I did walk out and go, honey, what do you think? She was there. And uh, I just needed one vote of confidence from the expert. There you go. And it's probably not helping. I'm calling it pink because it is red, but whatever. I mean, kind of, yeah. All right. So there's this fun little thing called buyer's remorse. I think everybody's had it. I think you probably all experienced it um, with clients or yourself. But there's that emotional high of a transaction that doesn't last forever. And at some point in time, that emotion comes down insert buyer remorse how do we address that well you're exactly right we have all experienced it think back to a time when you bought anything maybe this pink shirt for god's sakes one day i may wake up and decide that I, it's I just, red it's <laughs> <laughs> i love that we're playing this out though this is yeah, yeah, yeah. more likely something big it's not going to yeah. be a shirt most of us go okay if i don't like the shirt i just won't wear it who has shirts in their closet they don't wear that would be everyone and yes. at some point you thought it was a good idea to own that shirt, sure. but, and, but think about a vehicle or a car that, you know, a, a, an expensive stereo an expensive fill in the blank, that boat that you just went, it's a hole in the water to pour money. But at the time it felt like a, a really good idea. And the reason you had buyer's remorse is when you bought it, you were driven by emotion and whatever intellectual thought you have around why it was a good idea was overrun by the emotional energy attached to making that knee jerk decision. And then later your emotion starts to come down and there's only, you know, you can only have space in your head and heart for so much emotion and so much intellect. And when emotional emotion swells, the intellect gets crushed. The secret sauce to winning with buyer's remorse is when that intellect comes back and starts to play the subconscious, you know, voice of reason, as they say, which could also disable you. That's not always positive, even though it, its job, by the way, is to protect you, to keep you from making a fundamentally huge mistake and right. losing losing in the battle. And so the secret to all of this is to connect the dots between why you made the decision intellectually so that your emotion can swell back up and get excited by your decision. And I used to use this a lot with first time home buyers, particularly who, man, it's a big decision. Uh, you know, there's no bigger decision than a multi, you know, three, four, $400,000 home. And I, oh, back I found then Rick, it was a hundred K. All right. Well, I'm just trying to feel important. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. It was. It probably. I'm kidding. You've been in the industry a long time, but the the, the concept hadn't changed, right? Hey, it's Brett, probably gotten was, worse. Brett, I was in the industry when you still had carbon paper. All and right. Brett, all right. So just saying, the first first month in the business, we had books that had thumbnails of houses. We did. We weren't even online. But I think the point is, buyer remorse was then too. Even when it doesn't change, it's a human experience. But here's yeah. what I know. When 
things are forced upon people. And I use this example often. Like I put my hand up and go, put your hand up. And if you put your hand up against mine, Brad, as I start to press and press and press, people never withdraw. They just don't. They It's one in a thousand go, oh, you're you're pushing on me. You push back. That's just a human thing. And so people resist anything forced or pushed upon them. The secret sauce is to get aligned so that it's an awkward, you can't push against alignment. And so buyer's remorse is one of those things that if you attack early on in the process and you tell people they're likely to experience it, they resist it. They also don't want to be wrong. And so not that buyer's remorse is wrong, but it's perceived a weakness in, in advance of the feeling. Doesn't mean you can avoid the feeling. It's probably coming. But I try to arm them with intellectual intellectual weapons inside so that they can talk themselves off the ledge and self-administer medication or a preemptive, if you will, defense. Yep. And so I tell them, hey, you're likely to have buyer's remorse. In fact, seven out of 10 do. I go, but if you're one of the three out of the 10, I applaud your in intellect and your ability to look back at the list of things we made today and recognize that this is an intellectual decision with an emotional undercurrent. Is that fair? And by the way, 10 out of 10 people go, that's fair. Yes. So when, when your emotion swells, you make an important decision because you feel like the experience, your ego stroke, it's a, it's a smart play, but your emotion supports it. That's awesome. And later your intellect's going to start to second guess and, and throw up red flags going, Hey, is this a big mistake? Are you really, did you really get the deal you thought you were getting now that we've fully negotiated it out? And so by preempting, by saying you're likely to have this emotion, people tend to resist it. And I bet it's three out of 10. And yeah. then I give them a prescriptive formula. The minute you wake up with that knot in your body, when you're uncertain of something, where do you feel it? I ask that question to get them to own their feelings and also be aware of when it's coming. And they go, well, it's in my stomach or my head or my arm. I just get tense. I go, when you feel that, I'm going to hand you the top 10 things you want. Go back to your list and just make sure that you're fully intellectually justified in your decision. And don't call your cousin Eddie, who's a broker in New York. He'll tell you you're making a terrible, awful decision because they don't know the local market. Call me. You yep. and I'll have an honest, forthright, sincere, authentic conversation around your needs, wants, and desires. We're going to reanalyze the deal, and we're going to reflect on where you started and what you said a win looked like. And if those don't line up, we don't walk. We run. We run from this. And I'm, I'm going to lead the charge to protect you. Is that cool? The answer is yes. Now, I bet eight out of 10 don't have that feeling. They self-administer logic. They reduce that emotional uncertainty. They self-prescribe they self -prescribe a new, a better path. 100%. The ones that don't now have the green light to call me. It's not an awkward conversation. And they haven't fully committed to bailing on the deal before they reconcile their feelings. So that's yeah, how and I, I think up front. I'm sitting here asking myself, like, is this really a negotiation conversation and I absolutely think it is, but you got to understand not all transactions happen the same way. So if Rick walks into Tommy Bahama and buys a shirt, he's already paid for the shirt when buyer remorse, if he has it, I think you love the shirt. You look great in it. I'm, we're making fun of it, but it's an awesome shirt. Yeah, but uh, if you were going to have it, it would be after you were in the car on the way home. Absolutely. But if you bought a car today, the buyer's remorse happens after you leave the lot. You already own the car. But in our uh, daily bread uh, exercise, most of the buyer remorse happens from the time they sign the contract before they actually make the purchase. So it actually is a negotiation conversation because it'll blow the deal up and you have to address it where it may not be, we wouldn't be training a car salesman how to handle buyer remorse, but in, in, in a real estate space or a space where the contract of purchase has a period of time, you absolutely have to address buyer remorse from a point of negotiation. Well, just a reminder, the number one power force in a human's body is that fear of loss or missing out. That's way more powerful than the opportunity gained or the positives. And in the current scheme or market that we're in, it's not uncommon that there's competing offers. And sometimes you pay more than you think you should or could. And that is a real big trigger, a huge trigger for buyer's remorse later. They're you like, said fear of loss or fear of missing out. I think sometimes it's fear of being taken advantage of too. It is. It is. Or yeah. manipulated. 
I don't know about you, but I've made offers where they came back and said, Hey, there's a competing offer. My first thought is they might've made You're it. Lying. Yeah. It might not <laughs> even be true. And, but here's the deal. So what now, what if you're on the other, if you're on that side of the purchase decision, now it goes back to, you try to employ logic over emotion. You want emotion is just the desire to move forward, but you've got to really support their decision with strong data. It's got to be data driven so that later they can reflect on that, knowing that emotionally they probably overpaid a little bit. But that's the nature go. of the market. So what's it going to look like if you don't get it? What's going to look like to start over? What's your replacement strategy? These are all really important questions to go, hey, this is a recurring theme that may come back. And it's either swallow it now and get excited about your future or go re-engage and start over and suffer through again the whole process. What sounds most, you know, what's the most logical? And by the way, here's a tip. Use the word, what's the most logical decision you could make right now in light of how you feel? and try to help them flip the script and reflect back in a logic-based mode. I love it. I think this week, uh, what what we're challenging you on is really uh, going from amateur to professional in your business practices in terms of how you understand, communicate, and receive logical and emotional aspects of your negotiations. And... Um, it really is a skill set. It's not a, uh, it's not just a phrase of logic makes people think and emotion makes people act. There's an entire skill set around how to succeed around that statement. Rick, what would you challenge everybody on? So I would say this, it's, you know, we're talking about conversations with two or three or four human beings where you're navigating on their behalf as a representative. What about the conversation in your own head? What about you? Every, every, every step you make in left, right, or center is a negotiation in terms of your own DNA and your own decision-making chain. And are you driven by emotion or logic? And so I think the best challenge today is what in your life, personal or professional, should you be thinking about that if you made a decision for the betterment or the pro a proactive positive changes everything? Because deep down, you better, you know, create an avatar or list of, of data points so that if you make an emotional decision that you know makes life better for you, your family, your career, maybe it's hire somebody that, that needs to be on the team that's an expensive hire and it's a risk. Maybe it's um, double down on lead generation and get up and treat you know your business differently this week that you haven't in the past because it's not just an option, it's required for you to succeed and feel holistically um, successful. I love it. Um, maybe it's personal, maybe it's health. But what's the emotional decision that drives you to it? And then where's that printed document to support you in a logical way that you won't quit when that moment of truth shows up and fear eliminates that or prohibits you from moving forward? Even though right now you made a conscious decision in one of the quadrants of life and tomorrow you talk yourself out of it, just get really clear in what was driving that decision now versus fear or some disruptor tomorrow that kept you from that better version in that that particular decision love it say it rick say it mojo monday we love you <laughs>